Now, Frog Logic is headquartered in Hamburg, Germany. We were privately held and we were established in 2003. We've had U.S. presence since 2009 and have had steady revenue growth and been profitable since we were established. Um, we do have a large and growing customer base throughout the world. And you can see uh, some icons there or logos of the more than 3,000 companies currently using Squish. Now I promise I won't spend too much time on slides here, it'll be more focused on the technical presentation, but I do want to give you an overview before we get started. For those of you not familiar with Squish, it's a cross-platform, multi-technology, GUI automated testing solution. So what does that mean? Well, we do automated GUI regression testing, and our tool works across different platforms, different operating systems, and also across different technologies. So the combination of which allows you to test your applications in the different environments in which they run. For example, today, talking about the topic of embedded, um, whether you're working with you know, Squish for QT, or QT embedded, Windows embedded, Java embedded, um, we can work on those actual devices. We know the technology, we're familiar with the technology, and we support it um, at the technology GUI toolkit level, giving you access and visibility into that GUI toolkit, as well as the applications API. When you're creating tests and managing your tests, you'll typically do that from Squish GUI Tester. That's our IDE, our development interface. From that tester, uh, from Squish, you'll have access to perform record and playback. But as you know, or hopefully know, um, automated GUI testing is not just about record and playback. There's also scripting that you'll want to be able to use in order to create more robust tests, um, include logic into those tests, as well as um, refactor those tests to be reusable um, across perhaps different shared tests or tests that have shared information. Now to do so we offer access to um, some non-proprietary scripts, scripting languages. Um, you can see the selection here and we also as mentioned before we have technology dedicated GUI toolkit awareness meaning each of those technologies that we support, we are aware of the technology, we understand the technology, the GUI, its toolkit, and also give you access to that application's API. We support, you know, your standard objects as well as complex and custom objects. And if your application is made up of more than one technology, let's say um, you have an application, you know, some people are using Qt with WebKit or Java with Web or you know, maybe you have a Java application that when it's on Windows it uses some native controls. Whatever your combination may be, if we support those technologies, we support them as a hybrid technology or a multi-technology application and you can then test the complete application. Now, you'll see today how we can remotely connect to um, devices or systems and perform the testing, whether you're creating the test or playing back the test, and how easy it is to do that. We also offer a variety of integrations, and then some third parties have written their own integrations against Squish as well, as we do share our source code with customers, so people have been able to do that as well. Now taking a look a little bit at a bird's eye view of how we test an embedded application. Now this picture shows QT in there, but keep in mind we test different types of type of pardon me, different types of embedded environments. So Squish, first of all, from your desktop environment, will record the test over the network on your embedded device. So you're able to interact at the device level. And the reason we do that is because you don't want to have to, or you're maybe you're not able to, install the entire Squish environment on the embedded device, generate those reports, etc. from there. What we're doing is we're putting the minimal components on that embedded device, but those components are allowing us to communicate with Squish, communicate with your application, create and run those tests on the actual device. Now playback is very similar. You'll take those tests that you created. The Squish runner is going to communicate over the network to your embedded device, which has a listening Squish server on it, one of the minimal items that you install in that embedded device, which allows it to hook into your application and execute those tests and report back 
its findings. So how did the test do all of the logging and reporting, et cetera. So again, running that test over the network on those embedded devices. And I have multiple listed there because you can run them simultaneously across multiple devices. I mentioned integrations a little bit earlier. I'm not sure um, what tools you might be using um, aside from looking at Squish, but if you're using any build tools, um, ALM tools, etc., we offer a variety of integrations that helps you tie the entire process together. Perhaps you want to schedule your Squish tests to execute as part of your build process, or you want to assign these executions um, as work items off to different users to execute and monitor or associate them with your manual tests or other tests. So each of the integrations have their own um, approach, do something a little different, and then the reports are available from there for those that execute the tests. Again, if there's any questions, um, please do ask. As promised, uh, it was pretty good. We started at, what, 2 after, and it's 8 after, and uh, we're done with slides for the most part. So let's do this. Let's dive into the application. What I want to do is start from the window that you'll see when you first install Squish. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are currently evaluating Squish or um, plan to evaluate Squish, I do encourage you to download and take a look at it. But when you first install Squish, you'll see this welcome screen, and this is going to help navigate you through your first steps. How do I get started, um, take you to some tutorials, or if you've used Squish before, let you know what's new and point you to some web resources. To get out of this window, um, if you're not going through any of those steps, simply click Workbench. And for those of you that have worked with Eclipse before, you'll notice that this looks familiar to you. So what we have in front of us right now is the Squish IDE. I have a test suite open with some test cases. When you evaluate Squish, we ship with some example tests and test cases, um, and then I've modified that to show you a few other features. Now, I don't want to, I can, but I don't want to run this natively against this desktop environment. That's one of the ways you can do it with Squish. But we're interested in embedded. So what I've done is instead of making you uh, squint at a little embedded device over a webcam, I um, have a virtual environment here. So this virtual environment essentially represents my embedded device. It works all the same. So what I'm going to do with this virtual environment, or what I'm going to refer to as my embedded device during the demonstration, is I'm going to tell this device to listen for incoming requests from Squish from an acceptable IP address. Now to do that, um, I simply have to have the Squish server running on a specific port, and um, it will be listening for squish. So this shell script, and I'll show that to you in a second, simply starts the squish server on port 9999. So that's the squish port it's listening on. The file doesn't do anything fancy, it just saves me some time during my demos. Um, where I'm pointing to the squish package. Now remember, on your embedded device, this is a minimal squish package that's installed. It's not the entire package. And then I'm simply starting the Squish server on a particular port that I know and I'm telling the other, the Squish runner, to listen on or to communicate with. So we have that running over here and listening. So what that's going to allow me to do is come from a remote machine, a desktop environment, and connect to that machine and create my tests, work with my application, etc., all from a desktop environment directly onto my embedded device. So if I simply click run here, I'm going to run a test. You can see it's running within that virtual machine, so on that device. It does it very quickly. We'll see that a few times during the webinar. But you can see afterwards, I then have my report of what ran. I can double click on that, see the corresponding steps in the script. And if anything passed, I'd have that information, or failed, I'd have that information as well. Now, how do I create such a test case? I simply ran one there. Let's come up here and click New Test Case. We'll simply click Record. And you'll notice I have my control bar here, but I also have my embedded device that's the application then launched on that device. 
If I have that application already running and I want to attach to a running application, that's another approach you can take as well. So remember, this control bar is on my desktop, and this is my embedded device. Everything I do in here now is being recorded. Right, so I'm entering in some information, and let's say that after I enter in that information, I'd also like to validate, so I'm going to create a verification point. So I'll come back to my control bar here and click Insert Verification Point. There's many different types of verification points that you can create, or multiple types. We're going to create an object property-based one to take a look at an object and its properties. I could also create a screenshot or a table-based verification point. So I have my application object tree here, but I'm going to use the object picker, and I'm going to go back to my embedded device, and now that I'm at my, oops, let me close this, embedded device, any object I hover over, you can see that it's showing me some information about that. So I'm going to select what object I'd like to verify, and that back on my desktop returns me back to Squish, where I can see that object highlighted, and I can see all the properties of that object. Now, you have access to this application's uh, API as well, so not only to the object and its properties, but you can send API commands to the application as well. I'll simply click Insert here, and I'm back to my recording. I'm going to click Stop, and again, if you have any questions at any point, please do ask, and we can see the script that I recorded. Now, these scripts record just the same as if I were doing this locally. I'm starting the application. I am then, what did I do? I activated an item, and I'm, what did I activate? The file menu. Okay, how are we finding these objects? And this is the same across all Squish editions as well. We are finding the object because we have a symbolic name, and that symbolic name refers to an entry in my object map. So if I open that symbolic name in my object map, any objects I've recorded against are automatically placed into my object map. This way I have my symbolic names in my scripts. Should any objects change in my application, I'm not finding all the locations where that occurs in my scripts. I have a central location where I look up this object and see the object's real name. The object's real name is how we're locating or identifying that object. So in this case, it's a Q menu bar, and that's its parent window. So that's how we're finding this object. And then once we have the object, we're clicking on File. So you can see here, I'm finding the object, and I'm also waiting for this object. You'll notice these are automatically wrapped around the symbolic names, or if you want to use real names, there's a time and a place. Um, then what it's doing is it's making sure that that object exists, that it's visible, and that the object is enabled before proceeding with its wrapped action. So this activate item isn't going to occur until Squish makes sure that the object is there to interact with. Now, it's not going to wait forever for that object. Should the object not appear within 20,000 milliseconds or 20 seconds, so it's an optional parameter here, um, that when not defined is equal to 20 seconds or 20,000 milliseconds. But you can change that on a one-off basis. Thinking about it though, 20 seconds is a long time to wait for an object, unless you're pulling a giant report in which you'd have other logic checking the status of that. And so now it can continue and find each of these objects, interact with them just as I recorded them. Now what if it doesn't find an object and I'm working from the IDE and I'd like to troubleshoot why it can't find an object. What I'm going to do is right click on this symbolic name and go into my object map. Instead of OK, I'm going to change this to OKs. The reason because I know the, an object with these attributes and that text does not exist, but I'd like to show you um, what would happen in such a case. So maybe your object has changed in your application. So I'm simply going to click Run. It's going to run the test, and then you'll notice it's, it's sitting there, whereas before it completed right away, because it's looking for that object, that OKs button when it's just OK. Because of that default timeout, it's going to wait the 20,000 milliseconds to look for it. Again, something you can modify if you'd like that to be shorter or longer. And when it can't find that object, it's going to show you this object not found dialog. And what this is going to help you do, and it's an optional feature, 
um, or an optional dialog is show you the error that would have appeared in the script, let's say if you were running this unmanned or you chose not to use this feature, um, the object that we're looking for, and it's going to give you the opportunity to go out and select that ob new object, and from there do you want to just simply throw the error, do you want to begin debugging your script, or retry? So I'm going to go out and I'm going to select that object, Oops. and I'm returned then back to Squish, where I can now see the difference between the object that it was looking for and the object that I selected. At this point, I can retry, throw the error to bug. If I retry, I'll see if this change works. Sure enough, it does, and everything passed. Now my object map is updated with the object as we updated it in the object not found dialog to OK. Now regarding breakpoints and being able to troubleshoot scripts further, Let's go to um, another script where it will create a more interesting breakpoint. This particular script will simply record and playback. Many times you'll take a script and you'll modify that script so that it's not a simple linear script. Maybe you break it apart into separate functions, and from there you want to iterate through the script with multiple sets of data. Okay, well I have these separate functions. Well, what if I want to use those functions outside of just this script? I want to share those across my entire test suite. You can come to your test suite resources and you can create scripts and functions here that you can then access and reuse throughout your entire test suite. You also then have global scripts which are external to this test suite which you can share across test suites or as long as it's in the same scripting language you can use that within your test suite. So in this case I happen to have my test suite in Python. So if we go over to this script here, you can see that I'm telling Squish to look for an external file other than this test case because some of these functions in here, which I used the same name in another test case, so that's all that's warning me about, um, I have here these different functions that I'm using, and these functions actually exist in my test suite resources. So now I can use scripts that I've created and never want to reuse throughout my test suite or multiple times in my test suite. And then I also have created a data-driven script to iterate through, in this case, a tab-separated file, but it could be comma-separated, tab-separated, um, a spreadsheet, database, etc. Whatever you'd like to use to help drive your script using different sets of information. So if I simply click Run here, that same test or that test is going to run using some of those external functions that I have in my test suite resources. And one of the things I'm also doing in there is we have the ability to capture a screenshot either when a verification point fails or passes or at any point in time if you'd like or if there's an error. So you can not only have the logging information related to um, what you're testing, but you can also capture a visual at the time the error occurred. So in this case, instead of breaking the script, what I did is I have the screenshots captured at every verification point, no matter if they passed or failed. So we can see all of my results down here, and any verification points then had this reference file, which we can see then is a screenshot at that particular time. So that would be a screenshot captured on your embedded device at the time an error occurred, or in this case I have it capturing even as um, a verification point passes. Your reports are based in XML. Um, you can export the results here when you're working from an unmanned situation, so maybe you have your tests execute as part of um, your build process or as nightly runs. You're generating those those reports. Um, if you're using an integration, the integration typically pulls them in. Um, our reports otherwise are in XML. You can convert them using a script we provide to HTML. Um, and we have a few different outputs for reports other than that as well. Now let's say that there's an issue and I would like to set a breakpoint in my script um, to work through that issue. So we'll set it right here. And I'll click Run. 
Now by setting a breakpoint in my script, I'm going to be able to take a look at any variables and their values. I'll have access to that application object tree, much as I did um, when I was creating a verification point. I can go out and spy objects and see information about them. I have a script console where I can send commands to the application to see how the application responds. Um, I also can record snippets, so maybe I forgot to record a step or I intentionally am recording in segments, I can simply select record snippet. Or I can step through my script one step at a time or step over various functions. All available from the debugger. Now there's lots of other features that we have available in Squish that we don't have time to cover just in a webinar, but I do encourage you to take a look at some of the different resources we have available online at froglogic.com slash resources. There are also, there's also our documentation our knowledge base, and when you evaluate, you have access to our support as well, and you can email those questions to squish at froglogic.com. If we go out and take a look at some of the resources available online, um, if you're working with Qt Embedded, we do have a description of how Embedded works here as well. Um, and then if we go to resources, you can see access to our documentation, some of the integrations. Um, we offer external resources, blogs, um, some user communities, and then we have other screencasts and videos, as well as tech papers, customer stories um, out there for you to um, look at and learn more about Squish from. I'd like to open it at this time to uh, more questions. Okay, one of the questions relates to how am I connecting to that embedded device. So when I first create my test suite, um, or after you create your test suite, it's a setting actually in Squish. If we go to Edit, Preferences, under Squish, if you go to Remote Testing, here you have an option where if you're working on a desktop environment and everything's local, um, you would just use this default setting, which is start local Squish server automatically. But as we have it, as we have a Squish server listening on this embedded device or remote device, and we're specifying its host and IP address so that when we create tests and work with tests, it's automatically then connecting to that remote system. Um, one of the questions is, uh, QT on embedded Linux, how do you capture a signal emitted by the app? I know we have the ability to capture those signals, um, but I don't know off the top of my head how that's done. Um, if you email squish at froglogic.com, um, they will be able to help you with that, and um, it's also in our documentation. Um, I was able to pull it up in our documentation as well. Um, if you go out to our documentation and simply search signal, um, it's going through here how to use the QT signal handlers and <clears throat> how you can capture and work with those. There's other topics on there as well that are related. All right, well, I thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you have any other questions that you think of after the webinar, um, please do email those to squish at froglogic.com and we'd be happy to help. And I hope to see you online and in some of our user forums and evaluating Squish. Thank you.